Hello everyone and welcome to this Church Militant special report, Murder in the Diocese of Buffalo. Church Milton has been working on an in-depth investigation for the past few weeks on some nefarious goings on in the Diocese of Buffalo, New York, including perhaps what appears to be a homicide aimed at covering up information about to be released by a whistleblower priest regarding the well-established clerical homosexual network in the diocese. Now, before we begin, there are some disturbing crime scene photos during this report, so some of you may wish to turn away at that point. Now, some background first. The diocese has a sordid history going back to at least the mid-1990s under the reign of Bishop Henry Mansell, and even further to a homosexual assault by a priest on a six-year-old boy, Anthony Ravarini, whom Church Militant interviewed last month. Well, me and Tommy were running around just being kids. And then this gentleman came out from the building, <clears throat> which is known as Father Dennis Ryder. And he walked up to me and Tommy and asked us if we wanted ice cream, chocolate. I'll never forget it. Tommy said no, so we went back in the car and me, I said yes. So we approached the building, we went inside and he took me in his office and he nonchalantly came around and he was standing right in front of me and he dropped his trousers and he made me perform oral sex on him till he in my mouth and all over my face, it was in my hair. It was really disgusting. Now the priest who is accused of committing the foul deed, Father Dennis Ryder, is still in circulation in the diocese currently serving as pastor of St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Dunkirk, after having been reinstated just this past July, following two new additional charges of sexual assault, these against two altar boys. For a second and third time, the diocese claims there was no credible evidence to substantiate any of the accusations, just like they dismissed the accusation of six-year-old Anthony where Ryder made the fantastic assertion that the genetic matter on Anthony's face, hair, and shirt was his own at six years old, suggesting that Anthony had wandered into a rectory bathroom and done this to himself. That homosexual assault happened in 1992, and the diocese went to great lengths to deny it happened, despite the presence of two witnesses who saw the immediate aftermath just moments later. One of those witnesses was a Polish seminarian, young fellow at the time, stationed at the parish, who Church Milton also interviewed last month, Wes Wallowender. Wes eventually went to a local priest, Father Joseph Moreno, who was Wes's spiritual director, and together the two composed a letter to the bishop, Edward Head and Auxiliary Bishop Edward Groz detailing the disgusting facts of what he had seen, along with Anthony's father, who was the other witness in the aftermath. The letter, which was hand-delivered to the two bishops, was composed on Father Moreno's computer again. This was in 1992. Wes never heard anything from either bishop about the letter that he had submitted and was eventually railroaded out of the Buffalo Seminary. Father Joe, as a result, became increasingly cognizant of a clerical homosexual network in the diocese and began keeping informal records at first, which also detailed financial corruption, but nearly all of it connecting back to the homosexual clique. All of this has been confirmed by church militant with both family members as well as confidants of Father Joe's. Now, in 1995, Bishop Henry Mansell was made ordinary of Buffalo, and during his eight years as ordinary, a gay seminarian pipeline from mostly Columbia was established, following the pattern of Chicago Cardinal Joseph Bernadine and then Archbishop of Newark, New Jersey, Theodore McCarrick. Church Milton interviewed some of the Columbian seminarians, not all who were homosexual, and they confirmed for us that it was indeed a major recruiting effort by Monsignor Joseph Gatto, Vice Rector of Buffalo's Christ the King Seminary under Henry Mansell. All of this was becoming well known among local clergy. 
including Father Joe Moreno, who confidants tell church militant now stepped up his efforts to document these issues and keep records. Things reached ahead in 2012 when after years of documenting and detailing the homosexual clerical network in his diocese, Father Moreno was found dead in the rectory of his parish, St. Lawrence in Buffalo, on Saturday afternoon, October 13, 2012. Immediately, questions arose when his death was almost immediately ruled a suicide. Close associates as well as family, family simply do not believe it was a suicide, especially given a series of facts that would seem to rule that out. For example, first, Church Milton has learned that Father was ready to blow the whistle and go public, both to the local media and church officials on everything he had learned over the years. He told his sister, Susan, that, that very, she, he told her that very thing on the Tuesday before he was discovered dead. He repeated that to a close associate on Friday before again he was found dead on Saturday. Church Milton has confirmed that Father Moreno faxed a multi-page document to the local newspaper, the Buffalo News, on Friday night. The document itself has not turned up, but the record of the electronic transmission has. Additionally, Father had made an appointment to travel to Washington, D.C. the following Wednesday and, according to associates, to the papal nunciature and meet with officials there and hand over a copy of his dossier exposing the homosexual network in Buffalo. As an aside, the papal nuncio at the time was none other than Archbishop Vigano. He had also spoken with his sister, who routinely made dinner for him. That dinner on that Sunday night, he told her, would have to be wrapped up at a specific time because he had a very important meeting. This is on Sunday. Church Militant has spoken directly with the person he was scheduled to meet with, and that person has confirmed that Father had told them he was going to hand over a very important file to them, again, scheduled on Sunday, a meeting he obviously never made. Now, as events progressed, Father made what may prove to have been a fatal mistake. He got into a heated argument with senior chancery personnel and threatened out loud in a blustery temper to expose everything he was meeting with them about. He's going to expose it all. That was Friday morning before he was found dead on Saturday afternoon. Father Joseph Marino was found dead in his chair in the living room of his rectory with a gunshot wound to the left side of the back of his head. There are immediately problems with this account. First, Father had bad nerve damage to his left hand and it was difficult for him to hold things. Secondly, he was right-handed. Third, his personal handgun went missing two weeks earlier, according to parish staff. So a big question arises, where did the supposed suicide or homicide gun come from? A very damaging fact against the suicide determination is that a second autopsy arranged by his sister discovered not just one bullet hole, but a second hole that had been sutured, reminiscent of, reminiscent of mafia assassinations, two bullet holes to the head. Another issue is the manner in which the supposed suicide would have actually occurred. Now, according to officials, Father picked up the gun with his left hand placed it to the back of his head, and then reached around with his right hand and pulled the trigger. So what remains unexplained is how Father Moreno could have shot himself without getting any blood splatter on his hands or in the room. Also, how was Father positioned so comfortably in his chair with both arms by his sides, as we showed you, with no blood splatter or gunpowder residue on his hands? His sister spoke with the local ABC affiliate about the irregularities. There's no picture of the gun in his hands. His hands are closed. There's no blood splatter, blood misting on his arms, on the gun, on the wall where supposedly he, he did this act. At the crime scene, the fax machine with the phone number of the local newspaper stored in its memory was not there the fax machine that he had used less than 24 hours earlier. His desk drawer was broken into. Um, his file cabinet is missing. His current files are missing. His fax machine is missing. 
He did fax something to the Buffalo News the day of his death. Um, and I think it's relevant to get that four page fax because Joey was going to expose something. What it was, I'm not quite sure. Um, but he was going to, he was going to spill the beans on something and someone wanted him to be shut up and they did. Unsatisfied with the original autopsy and its finding, Susan spent a fall, small fortune having his body exhumed, her brother's body exhumed, and a second autopsy performed three years later in 2015. The medical examiner who performed the second autopsy said this, quote, after examining the evidence, I am not able to tell you definitively that this was a homicide, but I do believe serious questions have been raised, closed quote. When news broke in October 2012 that Moreno had been found dead, the Buffalo Diocese pushed the suicide narrative, offering no explanation really as to why. No suicide note had ever been brought forward, and Father Joe had made definitive plans for the following few days. We told you about it at the beginning of the report. Bishop Malone, who was new to the diocese a few months earlier, said he had met with Moreno the week before and the priest was reportedly upset that he was being transferred out of his parish. An article appeared shortly after that with anonymous priests claiming Moreno was a troubled individual with a checkered past, further trying to shore up the theory that he killed himself. Malone is the same bishop who lied about the number of priests accused of abuse in his diocese, initially claiming there were only 42, when the actual number is 106. Charlie Speck at WKBW in Buffalo has been doing a series of investigative reports exposing Malone's cover-up of multiple predator priests, his latest showing that Malone deliberately underreported the true number of homosexual abusers in his diocese by less than half. Now, we want you to stay tuned to Church Milton as we dig more deeply into this disturbing report of what appears to be cover-up of a hit job against a whistleblower priest, a priest who was set to expose the homosexual network in the Buffalo Diocese and appears to have been silenced before he ever had the chance. Reporting for Church Militant, this is Michael Voris. God love you.